I'm, I've been better. <laughs> What's going on? I'm still, I'm still, I'm nursing a good, uh, good chest cold right now. Oh, that's and, no fun uh, at all. The weather's just killing my neck, but, uh, but it's good. We're good. Did I'm sorry. Did the whiskey not help? The whiskey, yeah. <laughs> no, it did. I'm to the point that I tried it. It worked. Or at least I slept through half of it. Oh, <laughs> good. Good. So. We're doing a we're doing a honey tea and cough drops right now. I'm fully armed, so we're good. Okay, so uh, do you have all of your images ready to go? Um, no. No. <laughs> I'm pulling up in the hangout though. Okay. Um, I just switched laptops, so that's okay. I'll pull them up. No worries. Okay. Um. So tell me about the second half of Spear One for you. You've been really patient because you've been like on it and I have been a little absentee lately. Well, you know, that's really the whole <laughs> important part about this second half is is just taking a breath and realizing that you can't sorry. That's okay. play with puppies. You can't rush some things uh, and you really shouldn't. Uh, so exercising some patience was was a big step for me. I'm not normally a very patient person, um, but I, you know, I had a decision to make. I could get frustrated by it, or I could accept it and try to be helpful anyway. You know, and I I just thought about the bigger picture, and you know, if I was in your shoes, and and you know, what do I want this to look like one year from now, five years from now, whatever? And and when you look at it in that context, patience is really the only choice, right? You know, get, yeah. And upset isn't going to fix anything. That's only going to make me worse off. Um, I completely agree. My grandfather always used to say that patience is something we appreciate in the person behind us and not the one in front of us. <laughs> isn't that the truth? Um, so I'm in the community. I see the 20 images that you selected for level 8, but I'm not seeing the 5 that you selected for your level 9 critique. Okay, Did Google me... eat them, or am I just yep. missing them? Uh, good question. This Google Plus thing is still hard for me to get figured out. I'm trying to pull it up, too. Well, it's not just – I mean, I've gone into the community certain days, and when the servers are updating down here, I'll get in, and it'll be like, you can be the first to post in this community. And obviously, there's hundreds of posts from all of you, but some days it just doesn't show up, so – which is fine. If you have them um, set aside somewhere, then maybe we'll just have you share them. Um, okay. from we're, like, we're, looking, we're looking for the top five from those 20 then? Is, yeah, that's is that what you good? bring to level nine. So I have Chital's and Craig's. I don't see yours in there yet. Don't know where they got <laughs> eaten, but we'll just, we'll just pull them up. Okay. Um, so uh, obviously let's... Uh, I, I'm looking at the 20 of them. Let's lead off with uh, that wonderful, wonderful cat that you've seen before, obviously, is back again. Miss Penelope. She should be image uh, 12 in the 20. All right. So since we have all 20, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to change it up a little, and we'll do something a little different. Let me start okay. the screen share. And we'll go through, and here's what I want you to do. Since we rate on a scale of 0 to 3, um, 0 being why the hell would you bring this to critique? This has no artistic merit, which wouldn't accomplish any of your work. She works really good. Um, one is that it shows promise. Um, but that we kind of missed the mark on it. Um, two is a commendable image that's portfolio worthy, and three is an exceptional image that I would love to have in my portfolio. So let's go through and let's just grade them, and we'll only look at the ones that you rank at at least a two or a three as okay. like the best you have to offer. Okay. So, okay. So can you can you see my, that on my yep. screen? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so this this uh, sulcata tortoise, uh, I'd, I'd put it a two and a half uh, for a couple of reasons. I, we're not quite a three because I'd, I'd have preferred a little different moment from the tortoise. I wish his head would have popped out a little bit further, but anybody who's ever tried to make a turtle stick out his head, 
learns that that's impossible. <laughs> uh, but we have a couple things really going for it. Number one, it's not a traditional pet photo. You don't see a whole lot of tortoise photos. There's plenty of puppies and kittens and dogs and cats and whatever. So we have interesting subject matter in an interesting frame. You know, it's not pulled back and just a picture of a tortoise, even though this guy he was like 60 pounds. He was a huge tortoise, um, which is cool. But if you don't have something in there for scale, then it's not so cool anymore. And so this was just a nice detail shot. Uh, but what really drives it is all these repeating triangles. So as you know, you know, you're, you're an expert in this. Triangles create energy in mm. a piece. All these repeating triangles and, and this rich texture, uh, some good light. So really the, the thing that held it back was that the little guy wouldn't come out and play a little bit more, even bribing him with some lettuce and carrots and such. Uh, but overall, you know, I really like this shot. I do too. I love the I love the texture and the repeating patterns and lines. It's very visually interesting. I do agree with you. It doesn't even necessarily bother me so much that he didn't come out to play. I don't mind the fact that he's a little um, embedded into it, but I think um, that we lose him because of how big his his legs look comparatively next exactly. to his head. They're actually exactly. bigger. So I actually think that this would probably be a stronger shot if we cropped it in closer and cut off more of the legs so that what we saw of them was a smaller portion than what we were seeing of the head. That would be my best suggestion for improvement on that, um, that to just focus sense. in a little bit more. Because I think um, specifically on the left side here, um, that we have a lot of information that isn't necessarily adding anything. I think you could probably crop it right here and I would bring it in right around here and just see how that looks so that it pulls him out a little bit more. And then maybe adding just just a little bit of selective focus, almost in the form of like a focus vignette um, and softening it so that the sharpness stays around here would draw more attention to his face too. But I really do love all of this Rick's rich texture and the lines so I wouldn't want to go too far with it um just yeah. because I don't want to lose that so we're not talking at like you know like a 1.8 kind of thing but um just That's enough good. to take the edge off and sharpen up here just to keep you focused on this part I think would be the focus that's a good idea. Good idea. I think a square crop would work good there. Uh I'm gonna give you a one on this one just because we lost a lot of the texture. I love cat eyes, um, but I think we still need some of the definition in the face. So I'm vetoing that one. I've seen better work from you. I don't think that's portfolio worthy. Um, this one would probably be a one, two for me. I love the texture of the fur. I see the motion. I like the water falling. It looks like he was getting ready to shake, like getting out of the pool, I'm guessing. Yep, exactly. Um, but I wish we had more water coming off him and more energy. Um, I think if we had probably slowed the shutter speed just a little, which is really hard because they shake their heads harder than their bodies, so then we probably wouldn't have gotten the sharp nose and eyes. But um, it's harder, I think, with short-haired dogs, too, because with the long-haired dogs, you get all that motion of the hair whipping right. kind of effect. Um, the salon commercial <laughs> cliche. <laughs> Um, in canine form. So um, I like this one. I bet the pet owner was really happy, but I think because his eyes are semi-closed and he's looking off and we only have like a couple of the bits of water that we kind of lose what could have been really powerful in it. Um, I like this one again because it's interesting subject matter. You're kind of like crossing the line between pet photography and wildlife photography and you kind of use that as a jump rope which i think is really interesting because even um what isn't necessarily a pet kind of comes off as a pet portrait or an animal portrait more than some of the wildlife photography that i've seen which yeah. i actually really like because it's very intimate and connected exactly that that's why this shot uh yeah, I, I had to take these were newborn uh, mountain sheep lambs, and and again it, it makes that pet quality instead of that I'm I'm a wild powerful critter running through the rocks. It's just it's more personal and approachable. Yeah, um, and I like this one 
with the shallow depth of field, the light's a little bit harsh. I would have liked to have seen these shadows soften just a little bit. I think it really kind of cuts into them um, and makes them a little less cuddly, especially for, um, you know, the baby factor, like the cute little baby pet, baby animal mm -hmm. factor. Um, I think the harsh lighting kind of takes away from that just a little bit. Um, and I like the desert background, um, but because it's so monochromatic, I feel like the bushes compete because of how green they are. Like it's so oversaturated that it wants to pull you over here and away from them. Mm -hmm. um, so again, this one might benefit too from a closer cropping in or even just um, cloning this part out. But I don't know if that would leave too much negative space over here. I think it'd probably be better to just come in and crop it a little bit tighter and just let these ones go. I do, however, like, because you don't often think camouflage in terms of, um, like, lambs or even, like, most mammals as much as you do, like, reptiles and, and insects and birds. But I like that the color tonality is pulling out of their fur and their horns, and it's almost the same exact color as the... The nearby foliage yeah yeah this one i think is stronger than the other one i like that we can see the definition in the eyes there's so much truth to the fact that the eyes are like the window to the souls they just they they give they're what gives the personality and the intimacy to any kind of portrait whatever creature it is um, i agree 100 percent yeah, and I think that's something that, again, with the harsh light, and it's not your fault, especially when doing wildlife. Like, it's not like they sit and pose and wait for you to move the lights and turn <laughs> their head. Um, but I think that's what's missing from these ones a little bit is that it's just the black eye. Um, where here, I feel like we get a lot more uh, personality from him. Yeah, this one was cool. The final output is I printed that <laughs> uh, 24 by 20. Or I, I cropped it square, printed 24 by 24, and then uh, fixed it onto the piece of sandstone he was actually standing on in that picture and shellacked over it, so it's a super high gloss. And it was a cool, cool piece because it's uh, so contextual. Nice. This one I love. This is what I'm talking about. Like all of this energy with the water that I said was missing from the dog shaking his head. Like this is fantastic down here with all this pulling off. He's got every muscle in his body tensed for that Frisbee, not just his face and the face is great too. It's almost werewolf like. I could have yeah. a lot of fun stealing this photo and making, I might do that. I might ask you to <laughs> put like the unedited one up and for Halloween we'll all make werewolves out of him and, and compose him somewhere else. That'd be cool. Yeah, that'd, that'd be a cool. fun one. Um, because, I mean, he just looks like it. He's, he's going to rip something apart. He's really excited. But it's great. <laughs> it's great energy and great motion. And the water is really adding to all that. The lighting's beautiful on it. And this is a really good shot. Thank you. This one, too. I love the composition and the fact that we have this sort of... I look for visual vignettes in images because they really help draw your eye. And here you have it with, like, the lines leading right in. And the pavement that he's on gives enough empty space right around him here that nothing competes with him, even though we have like tack sharp texture and we have a lot of texture in like the leaves and the bark and stuff like that. It's far enough removed from him that you don't immediately fall off. I think it adds. And I love the energy and the happy ears. Anybody yes. that has a dog knows that emotion intimately. Um, which, it, like, that is, like, dogs, that's the difference. Like, cats are like, I hate you. Dogs are like, best day <laughs> ever, all the time. Yes. I'm outside, best day ever. Yeah. This is a good one, too. I wish we didn't have uh, this catch light over the pupil. It's making him look a little cross-eyed. Um, yeah, it's actually the sky reflecting in his eye. And that the, I just I couldn't match my angle to still get that gold sunrise behind him and lose the horizon. Yeah. So, but I loved the moment. Um, I love the moment too, and I like the sharp, sharp fur. So good one. I'm not a huge fan of the sunrise just because of how uh, shallow and how distorted it is with the blur. 
Um, this hot spot especially bothers me. I'd be inclined to go over here and sample from here and kind of fill that in a little bit um, just because that's so hot around it and the yellow is really uh, saturated. The yellow, this right here, this little bit, is the most saturated part of the image, especially because the dog's kind of a, kind of a soft monochromatic kind of um, fur color. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but whatever these plants are that are behind them or the trees, like the lines of them going up and off, I just don't think are, are doing a lot of favors. I prefer this side a lot more to this side of it. Um, yeah, it, was a, it was an Ocotillo cactus, which is okay. real sharp and spiny and so real busy. Uh, and going with the shallow depth of field is the only way to make that less busy from where yeah. it was standing. Yeah, so I like this one, but I don't love it. I love this one now. Mm -hmm. This is great. I love the personality. I love the eyes. I have a thing for owls too, so I'm a little biased, but... I love all of this texture in along the beak and then the softness of the feathers and yes. all this richness yes. in the color. I'm a big fan of um, the softening here going out too because I think it keeps you focused right on the face, which is where you want to be. Um, this is a really wonderful image. The only thing that I think would have made it better and it's completely luck is if he had, had actually made contact with the camera, he's looking just a little bit offside. Um, right. And I think right. if, if we had been over a couple more inches, that would have really taken it up to exceptional, but it's still still probably a three for me. I really like the color and the texture of it, and it's good composition all the way around. This one's adorable. Uh, it's one of my favorites of all times. Uh, I, I got... You get three labs this age, they're three months old, out of control, try to get them all to cooperate at the same time. And this moment was just so good because the two brothers are looking where they're supposed to, to, to their owner who's calling them. Uh, and then this other little female in the middle just looking straight at me like, no, nah, you're, you're the interesting thing going on. So yeah. I just love this shot. I just wish they'd have been positioned different on the bench, but that'd be like herding cats around. It's just trying to keep three puppies still. So I, I dislike the positioning on the bench, but I love everything else. Yeah, um, it doesn't, the positioning doesn't bother me too much. Um, you know, again, like ha half of it's luck, especially with animals in general, but especially babies, and especially if they're not yours. Um, right. You know, I have a hard enough time taking a picture of my dog and cat by themselves, let alone when they were, you know, babies and having playmates. Um, but the bench doesn't bother me. I like the added texture of it. The light's beautiful. You can appreciate all their fur. They look super cuddly. The tongues are adorable. Um, mm. I could totally see this as a big canvas print in any pet portrait studio. Um, it actually is a big canvas, 48 inch uh, yeah. hanging in the lobby yeah. there. Absolutely. This is exactly one of the ones that people would look at and be like, oh, I want to get pictures of my pets. So for me, it's it's total success in that. The warm tones work great. The bench works wonderful with the color tonality in their fur, especially in their ears. Like it just works really well in color theory as well as in composition. And it's cute puppies. Like you're, you're at such a handicap. Puppy photography is like right there with boudoir. Like, you know, puppies and naked women, they're always going to get likes and interaction, <laughs> whether it's good photography or not. So, right, right. This is pretty adorable. A uh, little um, Mick Papillon. That's funny. I can remember names of all the critters I shoot, but not necessarily the people. <laughs> <laughs> This is um, one of your benefits that I've seen that a lot of people struggle with when they're taking pictures of pets is either losing the shadows or um, blowing out the highlights. And you do really good at keeping 90% of it so that we can appreciate the fur texture all the way around. Like we lose it just a little bit in here. Um, but like the cat photo at the beginning that I passed over, uh -huh. um, that's a lot of why I passed it over is because like, most of the image is like, it's just, we lose all the texture and the detail in here and we have it here. Um, the color tonality works. It's a little hot right here. I like the backlight and 
you know, the warmth of the sunlight. Um, but I think we needed to move ourselves just like an inch or two this way so that it was squarely behind her um, rather than off to the side because it gets a little hot and oversaturated here, but I love it on this side. Um, you might even be able to go in and just select this whole side and then take it and flip it and put it on that side to soften it up at least around like specifically like this part right here is really, really hot. Or you could probably go in and just tone down the saturation of that a little bit. But other than that, I like it. I would clean out whatever this orange thing is um, and make it green all here. the way across because you have like this little spot. Right, it pulls and it's away from the tongue. Yeah. yeah I, nev I never noticed that and now I'll never unsee it again. <laughs> I do that too. I don't necessarily think that these are adding anything either. I'd, I'd be inclined to go in and, and take them out too and just kind of have like almost like a three tier thing and maybe even build it up a little bit more on this side so that it kind of indents around. But um, Or in contrast, take the white out and actually uh, warm it up a little all the way up just to make it softer. Um, but it's still, it's still a really really high scoring image, I could still see any pet owner being really happy with the shot all the way around. That one I love. We already went over it in the first one, so I won't critique it because we already did that. The only thing that really jumps out at me as a negative is just the positioning right yeah, here because it looks like something's broken. I would be inclined to go in and just soften it and fake it. <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome shot. All the way around it's a little it's a little natural um in terms of looking like it could almost be like straight out of camera um so i don't think that we're representing too much photographic technical excellence um but the positioning is great i love the composition the fact that you got them right in i like the symmetry lines the fencing here um, and that his tongue and his paws are perfectly in line to be over top of this one is pretty impressive. His expression right. is awesome. Um, I wish, and uh, you know, again, this is total nitpicking at this point, but I wish we could have moved him over, changed our angle just a little bit to get him on the inside of this one too, like right. he is here, right. or get him closer on this one. But any pet owner that sees this shot is going to love it. It's a little bit hot on the light around his tongue. I don't know if we could pull some of that back. Um, but that would be the only thing that I would say probably has to be retouched just like right along here and just a little bit along this Paul line. Um, Good point. Good point. But I, I love it. This is the, the person, this is one that absolutely says it's a good shot the personality and the moment takes it to a great shot with what would have been, you know, a, a good mediocre to good image. Um, the composition and the subject matter and the energy you get from it takes it up and scores extra points all the way up the board because of that. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> a good almost. Yeah. Um, love the energy, love the, the wind in the hair kind of feel that we have here. That's great action shot. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the fencing and I feel like yeah, not, it's not soft right. enough focus that we could probably cut her out and soften and take this away so that it just has the background without the lines. Cause I don't think that they're necessarily adding and they're so distorted that I just don't think it's adding to it. But, um, but I love the idea of the shot in general. Um, I like how high she is off the ground, but I also don't necessarily think that um, that it's adding anything. There's so much negative space that this one might actually work better if we just cropped it almost to landscape here hmm. um, and took that all the way out because um, it's not grounding her because she's not on it. So I like the soaring aspect, but I'm not necessarily sure that I think that it works as a portrait. I feel like her positioning and the long lines really would have been accentuated better if this had been cropped to landscape instead. That's beautiful. And I used to have a Cocker Spaniel, so I'm Oh, good. I'm super super inclined to like this one better. Um 
just a couple of things. The hot spot here, I think, is distracting. Um, and we pick that up just a little bit in like the rim light around the edges. That's kind of giving just a little bit of that radioactive kind of feel. I think toning down some of the color would work. Although on the upside of the composition and the color, we start to pick up these tones in her ball too, which I think helps ground her and that's better. This leaf would go for me. That, yeah, that's <laughs> one thing you're probably starting to see across my work is uh, I always have a repeating color in the frame. It, it's just the, the way my brain works or, or whatever, you'll always see a repetition of, of a color. And I didn't notice that until about a year ago when I looked at 30 pictures together and they all had the same thing. So the orange up above her, the orange ball, you know, every one of my pictures has something like that. Yeah, I like it. This is another one that I think that um, the negative space around it isn't really adding much to it. And we could probably cut off a couple of inches around and bring it in closer um, for her and it would do her a lot of, a lot more justice. Okay. Oh, I guess it me. This is a beautiful shot. This is definitely a professional pet portrait worthy. This is another one I would definitely see as a wall print in this studio. Um, it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful specimen. It's a beautiful pet. The lighting on it's gorgeous. You can appreciate all the texture of the fur. Um, I don't have I don't have any real critique for this one. This is a three flat out. It's beautiful in the background. Well, especially the, the backstory on this puppy. It was hideous looking. Had been totally neglected. It was kind of a, a rescue pound puppy kind of a thing. And I just saw it and said, "Sorry." Sorry, my son came out and woke everybody up. Um, anyway, it, it was kind of just a pound puppy kind of thing and ran a brush through it for about 15 minutes. And I said, this is the most gorgeous Sheltie I've ever seen. Yeah, that's what, and mine's a Sheltie right now. So again, I'm totally biased because I love them. Um, oh. But this is, this is a beautiful, it's a beautiful dog, but it's a really beautiful portrait of a dog too. This is one of my favorites. Um, I love the fur coming out. The only one that I would be inclined to uh, retouch is just this little one right here because we have this really strong line. So this sticks out oh, yeah. to me yeah. just a little bit. I would probably trim just that one piece, but I would definitely leave all of this over here so that we could appreciate it and coming off the sides here. Oh, <laughs> Um, I love that this is a really unique angle that we don't usually um, see in portraiture, which right. is interesting because it's probably the most common view that we have of our pets because we're always looking down at them. And right. usually I give the opposite advice of, you know, be at an angle you don't normally see things as, and that makes for an interesting portrait. But I think this is one of the first professional portraits I've seen of the animal looking up. Um, and it definitely makes for an interesting perspective as far as a portrait. Uh, the I, do, I, I do the same thing. I tell everybody, don't take pictures looking down at your pet. They look horrible. <laughs> but, you know, here's here's when you break the rule. Yeah, and when it works. That's that's the whole point is, is understanding when you can break the rule. And here it does work. I'm not a huge fan of the... Uh, the white tile lines, I don't necessarily think that they're adding to the image um, because there's no symmetry with the cutoff. So I would probably go in and just clone these out all the way around and have it be a white backdrop. I think they're a little distracting. Um, and the buckle on the collar, whatever this is, I think that specifically is so close to the face. Um, and it's intelligible what it is visually, um, I would be inclined to edit that one out too. But other than that, it's a beautiful shot. I love the focus, I like the lighting. The eyes are completely alive. He's just at attention. Oh, Stella. This is fun. Um, again, love the energy. You're really good at, at getting really good energy and life from the pets, which I think is really good. And I love the light and the fact that we can appreciate the fur. Um, the texture on this is just great, and I like that we kept enough of it in focus. This is one of those areas where um, usually I tend to shoot shallow so that it 
the background doesn't compete with the subject. But here I like um, the diversity in the texture because of the color. You get like similar textures in the grass that you are in the fur because he's kind of like, he's got that raggedy like yeah. lady in the tramp kind of fur. Uh -huh. um, and that playful like troublemaker kind of feel to him. Um, and I think that that's repeated in the grass, but the color contrast makes it work really well together to pull together. Um, this is the only thing that's bothering me is whatever the toy is that's behind him. I love the one here because that's the one he's playing with it. But this little spot of blue is oh, distracting, yeah. I think. So I would take that out and I would probably take the pole out and just continue the fencing pattern. Yeah, you're right. You're right. This is uh, awesome. This one nearly killed me. <laughs> That's a dwarf pygmy rat. It's our most dangerous snake here in Utah, and he bit me right after I clicked the shutter. Mm. I was three hours from help, and yeah, nearly died, but uh, got a great shot. <laughs> um, I don't condone dying for your shot, but I love this photograph. I love the texture and the repeating patterns on it. I love the colors and the contrast and how it's pulling out. He looks like he's about to attack you. Yep, it was worth it. <laughs> um, and I like the texture um, of the, the leaves and the branches around him too and how he's fielding into that and that we're seeing the repeating colors and, and patterns in the dappled plate and how that repeats on him for like, the camouflage, like, I like the animal and its element. Turkeys, same thing. Look, like, the, it's interesting because you don't think of these as uh, camouflage. Like, you would buy it on the brown, but you wouldn't think of, like, the gullets and heads. And I totally see, like, the shades of, like, blue and purple in the background here and the flowers and stuff. They just blend right in, which is really That's cool. That's exactly right, yeah. 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 Um, that said, we lost we lost a lot of the um, the texture, the feathers in the shadow because of the dappled light, and it's really hard to expose for post. So it's a good image. I like the composition. I think that we could probably crop in a little bit closer on this side, and um, maybe yeah. down a little bit. Like you could probably get rid of the second row of flowers and just keep the first one, and bring it in a little bit tighter. Um, this is one that it's a it's a good image, but I wouldn't I wouldn't grade it at a professional level for wildlife or pet photography for me. It's interesting, but it's not phenomenal. The snake photo, phenomenal. Mm. You know? Um, so you like you can tell when you're in your element, but also the turkeys aren't gonna kill you and I can appreciate that. Right. They might, they can right. Be um so I like it, but I, it's difficult when you have this kind of subject matter out in the wild where the light is so so spotty and dappled to get a good exposure to be able to appreciate them all. Um, so you're kind of, you're fighting with nature. That's Some of that's just luck at the draw. This one, I don't know that it would make your portfolio for me. It's a great concept. I love the idea of it, and I love the color and how that echoes and goes back and forth, but I, I just don't think that it's quite up to par with some of your other pieces, so. Understood. All right, that's all 20. We got um, through it pretty quick. Yeah, it was it was quicker critique. We didn't spend too much time on each of them like we usually do, but I like getting to look over all the work because um, there's a lot more consistency, so. I'm definitely I'm definitely seeing some improvement. Were any of these new, or were they all stuff that you pulled from your portfolio? Uh, the turkey shot would have been a couple months ago. Um, everything else was old stuff. Okay. Um, so for level 14 and level 19, I definitely want to see some new work from you too. Sure. Sure. Um, I think that that'll be really good. How are you? How are you feeling going through the first ten levels and looking at your work? Are you coming to any new realizations about what you're shooting or what you want to do, or feeling focused or lost? No, not not lost at all. Uh, it, it's a fun stage. Uh, this last month, I've shot nothing but <laughs> film, doing a lot of bless you, doing a lot of experimental film work just just to recharge batteries and have fun. Um, I did a a real fun series in the fall uh, that's abstract work, um, 
and that's totally out of the norm for me, but it was really fun to do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a journey. Uh, and I, every, every project informs the next project. And, uh, I'm about to start my next political project that I'm kind of excited about. Uh, it's gonna draw a lot of sharp criticism, uh, but it's definitely gonna draw attention, um, to, to an important idea. And, and so that kind of stuff's all fun. You know? Awesome. So I don't know how political you are. Uh, we've talked about some of these things, but uh, this this whole idea of pr police brutality that's gone around, and, and certainly there's there's not the majority of cops are not bad guys, but there is a growing problem, and and the problem is that they're all shielding each other, and that makes the good guys bad by default by protecting the bad guys, and so they they call that the thin blue line, you know, that you don't cross that blue line. So I'm going to take a blue filter on my lens and shoot uh, various scenes with police in it, whether they're writing tickets or arresting people or whatever, through this blue filter as the concept between this thin blue line. So anyway, okay. fun project. We'll see how it works out visually, but I like the concept. Well, from the artistic standpoint, you know, my general personal personal thoughts and feelings aside on any subject um, that is a hot button issue. My advice from this standpoint of mentor and photographer is say what matters. Right. You know? So if this is something that matters to you, especially if, you know, if you're hitting something, this is one of those things that you'll get a lot of criticism and a lot of applause and no one will feel particularly neutral about it. And that is always a good thing from the standpoint of having people talking about your work, which really, you know, if you're not affecting people with your work, then you're not creating art. You're just taking pictures. Like, I think that that's a lot of the, the line. And I also believe very strongly that, you know, we're given our gifts in order to give them away to a greater purpose. So, you yeah, know, I, I know you do a lot of work with, uh, with military and veterans and soldiers and, and stuff like that. So, um, I, I think that if you're not offending anyone, you're probably not being courageous enough. I um, agree. I agree. It doesn't mean we're right all the time. Right. But, but <coughs> we, like you said, you have to say what matters and this kind of stuff matters to me. We need to have a dialogue, you know? Yeah. And I, well, I think the important thing with it too is that it helps both sides understand their feelings a little more about it. So, you know, even if I was to say that I'm on the complete opposite side and that I don't think that it's police brutality, that only people, you know, that that deserve it or that are attacking get attacked or whatever, if I took the complete opposite stance to the nth degree and you create these and that has to make me stop and defend my position or argue my thoughts or even second guess them, then either that helps me to change my mind or it helps me to solidify my views based on that. And, and that helps me improve my argument for my side to convince people on the other side to come to my side, which is how resolutions I think get made. So I think it can be really important. Darn and I talked about that and he made a joke cause he's like, well, he's like, it's a good thing I'm not in America. He wants to do this shot of, um, two gay men kissing and you know have this whole like gay pride thing and he's like yeah if i was in america i'd be screwed because you guys just legalized it all he's like hopefully um australia <laughs> doesn't no do that right. yeah australia doesn't do that because it'll be a lot more a lot more potent right now without them doing it um yeah that's exactly right which is funny because the whole reason for him wanting to do it is to say how stupid it is that it's an issue. But if it's no longer an issue, <laughs> you know, then it becomes less important to say, which is an interesting, I was like, so you want them to not legalize gay marriage so you can talk to them about the importance of legalizing gay marriage. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I want them to do it after I create the image, you know, so, right. which is funny, but there's, there's always causes. So I like that you're brave enough to cross those lines with your work, even though you know that that means there will be some, some fire in your direction that isn't necessarily friendly. I think, I think that's courageous um with creatives so i applaud it well thank you so um and i think it's both you know as far as like personal thoughts on it like you know there's always both there you know there's been a good cop bad cop you know 
cliche since like movies in the and shows in like the 50s and 60s that's like the whole thing right you play good cop i play bad cop like there are both there are good and bad people in every position so you know um i think you're right it doesn't i think it's the minority i don't think that it's all of them but i do think that it happens and i think one time is one time too many so holding them accountable is good but more importantly inspiring a conversation that brings about change is important so all right so um you have passed your level nine with flying colors i'm seeing a lot of consistency in your work i'm seeing a lot of um style in the lighting and the composition that's starting to make it apparent that i feel like i could put yours in with 10 other um wildlife and pet photographers and i could probably I could probably pick out at least 15 of the 20 as yours. And the ones that I wouldn't are the ones that I said were subpar. So now I think we're to the point where we can be a little more selective in what is making the cut into our portfolio because you're good enough that you can, and it's funny, like if you look at people that are just starting, they're inclined to put 100 images in instead of their 10 best because right. they feel like they have to have enough work to make it you know, to go, oh, you, look, I'm shooting enough that I am actually a professional. And then I think the better you get, the more selective you get. Cause you're like, oh, this is rubbish. This one yes, doesn't make yes. it. This one doesn't make it. And then you look at the stuff that did make it a year ago and you're like, oh, God, what's that <laughs> thinking? Um, one of so. my favorite lines is the difference between the pro photographer and the amateur is the amateur shows everybody all their work. Yeah. My favorite is the difference between um the difference between a master and a beginner is that the master has failed more times than the beginner has tried Amen. Um, that's, so, i just posted that last week on uh, facebook nice yeah that's one of my favorites i love that one so okay since you didn't post your top five in level nine your assignment is to go through and decide which five of these would be your portfolio if you could only have five on your website Okay. So now going through, looking at the critique, I'd like you to pick your five best. And I would like you to look at them from two points. One, your strongest images. And two, which five show your voice collectively as, you know, as a collection, as a whole, that we're seeing consistency in the composition, the color, the stylization, um, which five you feel best represent you as a photographer, not necessarily the five individual best pieces. I'm curious to see which, which ones will make the cut. Okay. Um, cause I think probably like your cat photo is probably one of the best photographic images. Like that would probably be the one that I would send you into competition with if we were rating a single image and grading. Um, but I think that you would have a hard time picking four that would really match that one. Yeah. Collectively, um, probably the Sheltie on the black backdrop because you have the same kind of negative space, but you wouldn't be able to include any of the goats or the outside ones. Like those would not necessarily fit with it. So it'll, it'll be interesting exercise, I think, for you to go through. Um, and I'm totally okay with you picking um, images that are not in your 20 from level eight, just out of your entire portfolio. But I'd like to see five images that you think are, um, the best work you have to offer while also offering a congruent style. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going to get elevated to 10. I already got your email because you're an overachiever like me and you send them out before you're supposed to. So you're done that. So I'm going to grade you up. Um, you'll get, um, an email from the Arcanum saying you've graduated the foundation spheres and an invitation to continue on in sphere one. You can continue with me or you can wait in the antechamber for someone else to pick you up. It's your choice. And then um, I know that you wanted to get into the path of the protege. I am all about that. I don't know if you've heard, but they actually closed the path of the protege down um, for a couple oh, of months. You. Okay, so it's just it's just on hold. It's a postponing until the end of the year. They're completely revamping the path um, because they're doing a huge website upgrade. So um, the way that we interact with you and what our back end looks like as far as you guys logging in is gonna totally change. Um, I don't know if they've sent this out. I might not be allowed to talk about this, but by the time I, know, I, I Trey, Trey did a video on it. I, okay, I, did I didn't know if that went out just to the masters or to all of you. 
So, um, yeah, so you've seen the video. So it's totally different because now you'll actually be going into the Arcanum database and going, hey, I'm ready to level up, and you'll be check marking that your things are complete. You'll still be posting them in the Google communities, but the the idea was to upgrade the path of the protege to train people in the new software. And what we didn't want to do is have you guys hop in and then learn on the old stuff and start your cohort. And then two weeks later, have to learn a totally new platform. Right. Makes um, sense. So they're also uh, marketing and we have a bunch of people that already graduated that are in queue. So um, what we don't want to do is we want to let everybody come in and fill their cohorts and we don't want to put everybody in the barrel at once and then not have enough people to fill each individual cohort. So uh, probably sense. in the, um, towards like the end of, uh, I think we're going to try to open it for the people that are still in the path that are partway through um, in like January, February. So probably March, right around the time that you're towards the end of um, sphere one. And if you graduate, I can still put you in, even though you're in level 20. Um, I can write you the letter of recommendation to get you into the path. When it begins, it'll just be a little bit before you actually start it. Okay. Um, so in the interim, um, if we're going to look at that, then one of the things that I usually do with my potential protégés is I put them in basically a position of leadership in the group, which you've kind of already done and taken upon yourself, so I think you'll be fine with this. So what I'm going to do is actually make you a moderator um, okay. in the Google community so that you can help with anything people need. You'll have the ability to post and move things around, and um, your job is to be a community manager. Um, okay. which will be a really good experience for you. And if you, this is totally elective, so you have the ability to not do it. Chris Arnold does it in my sphere too. And it's basically just helping with engagement and doing all the things that you're doing now, like the posts of, hey, let's do this, or who needs help, or, you know, what can I do for you? You're kind of a liaison. It also puts a point of contact in between, so people can come complain to you and be like, Jay Lark needs to get her shit together, and <laughs> you need to tell her, and then you can come and go, I got an anonymous suggestion that you should really get your shit together. <laughs> um, and then I go, okay, thank you. So um, it's, all about, uh, it's all about community engagement and improvement, but it'll, it'll give you a good feel for what it's like kind of running your own cohort without any of the responsibility or lashings when you mess it up. Okay, um, cool. So I would like you to be my official community manager until uh, the Aurora's graduate because this is my last foundation sphere. So you Good guys are last. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what else? What do you What do you see going forward into sphere two? What would you like to do? Well. Um... <laughs> No, I'm really having a heck of a good time with, uh, in fact, here, let me just show you some of this stuff real quick. Um, uh, pictures. Now I've got to share for you, right? Yep. Hold up real quick. Okay, yeah. Uh, in here. Green is screen share, entire screen share. Okay, so now you're seeing me probably. Are you seeing this? Yep. So I've been doing a pan blur project on film, uh, which is really cool. This whole idea of plants grow vertically, so I'm, I'm panning bottom to top, uh, just kind of expressing the the passing of time, you know, our, our cameras freeze time, which we worked so hard for so many years to do because our shutter speeds got faster and faster and then we synced to strobes and such. And we're trying to freeze time when time really is this intangible thing that keeps moving. And we're moving through it. So this whole idea of movement through time, panning is physical motion and elapsed. And, and I'm using it to create textures and colors and uh, anyway, super fun project, especially because it's back to analog instead of digital. Um, and, and it just gets these wonderful abstract uh, painting-like images, taken photography different. Um, and the other thing I really like about it is we get analogous color this way too. Color just happens in nature in a way that goes with nature. You know, nature doesn't put neon green next to... Uh, 
to uh, purple. You know, it just it doesn't happen. And so you get these really beautiful uh, color combinations. Uh, this I was. Love these. I know they they just they feel they they're, they're so emotional uh, and the color palettes are just so appropriate. So I can't paint with a paintbrush, but I can paint with light and. It just got me thinking. I, I'm doing these all on big canvases, and this this whole idea of I, I'm a painter w without a brush. Uh, and I'm just really getting a kick out of some of this stuff, to where they're not quite so abstract. You can't tell what they are all the time, but again, this analogous color and this texture, movement, time. Anyway, just super cool little project. So I'm gonna keep shooting this for another little while. Um, I'm also going to start that uh, Thin Blue Line project. Um, so that, that's kind of what I'm working on currently. I just... I'm, I really, really love these. And I really think, um, going back to your level four critique and talking about the work that you do with veterans, that this would be an incredible art therapy project to do with them and teach them I'm how to do. I've I, I, uh, got one guy, uh, sadly, he's... He's doing very poorly, may not be with us much longer. Um, but I took him out and taught him this technique in an aspen grove because he saw my one aspen picture. He says, I've got to learn that. I said, piece of cake, we'll, we'll go work on it. And we did. And and now he's trying it with all kinds of things too. And it, it, yeah, it, it's like you say, somehow this connects with their psyche differently, maybe because it's not so clear and defined, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. It's like a, it's like an artistic color version of ink blots. I could see a lot. I could see a lot of mental exploration and emotional expression in these. Yeah. To be. This would be really incredible to do as a group show. Um, that's what, I, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I've actually got a gallery in Salt Lake that's willing to give us a showing if we can put together a body of work. So. Now I just got to get more of these guys doing more of this stuff. And, you know, you, these are almost a little bit angrier. And I, I didn't intend it that way. This was some of my first shots. But now seeing how it plays out, I, there's just so much that can be expressed this way. So I'm excited. I am too. This is really, this is really beautiful. It's really unique. I haven't seen anybody else doing anything like this. Um. I, I love your I love your pet photography. I think your landscape photography is really good too, but you know, with the work that you'd like to do and the people that you like to do it with, I really, really think that you're on to something with that and how that would translate to being able to teach people that aren't necessarily trying to be professional photographers. Right. right. Um I could see that being a really healing exercise and a really incredible personal project and body of work together. I think you should explore that more. Um, I would, goal. I would totally, I would totally recommend um, from the standpoint of, you know, master advising the artist and from the standpoint of path of the protege and running that building your, your sphere. Um, experience as a master around that and having them come in and just express that could be really liberating even for the pros like you know the problem with success is that you get busy which is a great problem to have right. um but a lot of the reliquarium was me really getting burnt out with everything else and i love what i'm shooting like i get to shoot with people that i love but i'm always doing it for someone else and it gets repetitious like i almost threw my green Victorian couch out of the studio and off the balcony. Cause it was just, <laughs> I, you know, and everybody loves it and it's a beautiful couch and they're like, well, you've never photographed me on it, you know? So they love it. But like, you know, you can only stare at a green couch for so many years. Right. Um, no matter how new. funny it is. Yeah. So being able to pull a bunch of people from, I don't know how to take my camera off auto to, I've been a professional shooter for 10 years and I don't feel inspired. You could create some really, really powerful expressive work with that, that I think would really affect the artist and the viewer. I really, really like this. I think you should, I think you should really grab onto that. If you're enjoying it and if you're like, ah, oh, this is like, you should follow that. Cool. You should follow that like all the way to the end and, and widen out on that one. I think you hit on something really special with that.
Cool. I'm yeah. glad you liked it. So, um, and I think you should bring a bunch of them to your level 14 critique. Sounds good. That sounds good. Yeah, let's do that. So, um, bring them and um, bring a bring a very generic, um, not generic. Bring a a general like one page proposal for what you could see teaching um, 20 levels around that. Okay. I think that would be really fun to see the collection as the artist and then see how we could translate that and have other people learn to do it. That would be really fun. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Did you have anything else that you wanted to touch base on while we had time? No. Just get well. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to drop. People depend on you. <laughs> Mm. All right. I'm glad we got to sit down. Thank you for letting me reschedule because I've been talking like this the whole time. Um, it was pretty brutal. Um, so I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the good energy that you've been putting into the group. It's been really helpful because I know I've been a little under the weather and lackluster the last couple of weeks. So it's good that that energy was overcompensated for um, its absence. So I'm appreciative. Happy to help. Happy Thank to help. You. All right, uh, keep me posted. I'm going to upgrade you in the level. You'll get the invite, and then as soon as you click accept, we'll move you over into the Sphere 1 community. Okay, thanks, Jessica. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right, have a good one. Bye-bye.